Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Ben, for leading us and uh, for the songs you chose. Well, back some memories from the room. Really good. And uh, applicable in some ways to what we're going to look at um, this evening. Thank you, all of you, coming out after quite a busy weekend. Um, uh, thanks for that. And, uh, it's good to be here this evening and to begin our studies in the Minor Prophets. And, uh, Hosea is the um, first of those books. It's not the first chronologically, but it's the first that we find in the scriptures. And uh, so um, that, that's where uh, we begin. Um, put this... Uh, I tried to prepare this slide from, um, if you um, do Google Images, for example, you can find loads of all sorts of complicated different colors and, you know, and uh, so I, I, I've just tried myself to um, do something to sort of put it in, um, in some sort of uh, perspective to see where Hosea fits there amongst the prophets and amongst the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. Of course, the first few verses of um, Hosea give us uh, some ideas of uh, when he was uh, uh, prophet Simon at a turbulent time in the history of um, Israel and Judah. He prophesied to Israel, the northern kingdom, sometimes described as Ephraim, and I said those opening verses give us some idea of a time frame of about 70 years. And these were not good times for Israel and Judah. The people were often led by their kings who forsook God and turned to idols, and all the sinful acts that were associated with that. Principally, Baal or Baal, however you uh, want to pronounce that. And so this evening, with that sort of background, we're looking at these three uh, opening chapters of Hosea. We didn't read the chapters. I asked if you would like to do some homework and read uh, before you uh, came, uh, because uh, you know it would take a, a while to read the chapters before we. Uh, then get to speak about them. And so um, have your Bibles open, as it were, and sort of um, we'll go through this um, together. And so, as I said, verses, verse one gives us a sort of sex to see of this uh, man, Hosea, prophesying at the time of these uh, kings. And then we um, come to verse two, and uh, I've given uh, the rest really of this chapter a little heading, uh, meet the family, because that's uh, what we have here. So uh, we see that uh, we have Hosea's account of his family. He tells us that at the beginning of his mission, the Lord told him to get married. Possibly good advice. Um, even if we go all the way back to Genesis, Adam needed a wife, didn't he? A helpmeet. So that's a, uh, a good start. But uh, can you imagine if you've never read this before, it says that God told him to marry a particular kind of woman. Not necessarily a beautiful woman or a rich woman or a clever woman, but a promiscuous woman woman. Uh, I suppose modern days, it would say, marry a woman who is a sex worker. We have to use that word now, don't we, to sort of be um, politically correct. Um, uh, uh, this particular type of woman. Of course, in the authorised version, it um, uh, uses the word a wife of whoredoms, um, which perhaps in some way, because that's in the plural, really describes what 
Hosea's wife turned out to be. So did Hosea go searching through the town, the red light district or whatever, to find that particular type of woman? Well, that may well have been uh, the way of it, but it's possible that he didn't really know um, that she was of that uh, character until they got married. And during their marriage, she became unfaithful. Of course, an all-knowing God knew what would happen. And uh, it links, of course, to the prophecy uh, that this narrative that we have. So when Hosea begins to record his prophecy, he goes back to the beginning and recalls his marriage to Goma and how it turned out. And in doing that, he was able to draw the parallel with Israel and their unfaithfulness to God. Which again, it, um, you know, is um, described in various translations of the scriptures as adultery and so on. Hosea's sad and disappointing experience of an unfaithful wife will have deepened his understanding of God's hurt at Israel's unfaithfulness. And so when we uh, get to verse 3 onwards, we, we see uh, Hosea's children. And uh, there's a significance there in their, in their naming. So we, un we understand that his firstborn, we're told that she, uh, Goma, his wife, she conceived and bore him a son. But when the daughter is born, it says Goma conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And when their third son was born, after she had weaned Lo Rumah, Goma had another son. And so most commentators conclude that the daughter and the son were not Hosea's children. They were conceived with other men. This was the result, the consequences of her adultery, of her unfaithfulness. And in the same way, Israel's unfaithfulness had consequences, then so too would hers. And so we have this, um, these, uh, these names uh, given to these children. So the first son was, we're looking at verses 4 to 8 now, but the first son was named Jezreel. This was a town in Israel, and the massacre referred to is recorded in 2 Kings 9 and 10. This is all about uh, Jehu, one of the kings of Israel, who was zealous for God in wiping out Ahab's uh, surviving family and his wife Jezebel. In that sense, Jehu was one of the Good guys, as it were, um, because uh, of uh, what Ahab and Jezebel had done and how they'd led uh, the people into idolatry. But his motives were questioned. And although he uh, killed the prophets of Baal, we read later on that he was not wholly devoted to the Lord. And uh, when we... Uh, read into the story, we see really that Jehu was a bloodthirsty character um, and uh, seemed to really take, take delight in, in that. And so um, we uh, find that, uh, speaking of Jehu, we have these um, solemn words about punishing the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. So here's a prophecy uh, about the kingdom of Israel coming to an end. And we know from history that this was ultimately fulfilled. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians they invaded the northern kingdom, and ultimately the capital, Samaria, was uh, captured, and the people were taken uh, captive into Assyria. The land was populated by other people, and to all intents and purposes, the northern kingdom disappeared. And uh, so uh, we, we read that, 2 Kings 17, 
18. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removes them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. That's uh, the consequences of um, Israel's uh, conduct, his unfaithfulness. Then we have this daughter, who is probably not Hosea's, called Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved. What a start in life to be called not loved. Those of you who had children, do you remember? When you held, especially a daughter, I mean, I remember when I saw my little daughter for the first time. It was just magical, wasn't it? How could you say to such a child, not loved? Of course he was loved. But of this daughter, she begins life not loved. And of course, this is used to contrast God's judgment on Israel and his love for Judah. Because Judah will be saved. But again, not by force of arms, we're told, but by God himself. In Zechariah 4, 6, 8, we read, So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God's going to achieve these things. He's going to do them his way. And that points us to the cross, doesn't it? It points us to a great deal of what we heard yesterday and even this morning, doesn't it? Of God's grace and love. And uh, I was very struck yesterday where um, Paul was urging us to have a real appreciation of the gospel. What it really means. And so... Um, uh, this, I think, points us to the cross. So this young lady, this child, not loved. And then we have the, a son. Again, probably not Hosea's, called Lo Ami, not my people. And so here as God views Israel's idolatry and immoral behaviour, he concludes they're no longer his people. He disowns them. I did wonder as I read through this whether as each child was born, was the situation between Hosea and Gomer in their marriage getting gradually worse? Were, were the rifts getting wider? I think that's probably very likely to have been the case. And uh, similarly, uh, as regards Israel, there was no improvement. There was no turning back to God. And um, if you go back to uh, 2 Kings and read through those chapters there, 14 uh, to 17, you see really a hopeless um, situation. So here's a grim prophecy, isn't it? Not my people. A hopeless situation. A future that is no future. No hope, only Judgment. If you read through uh, this before coming tonight, you you will have sort of think it was on a bit of a roller coaster. Went like that, didn't it? Because when we get to verse ten of chapter one, we see the we find this word yet. You like those little words in the Bible? Yet, but. They sort of act like a, a hinge, a pivot sometimes, on which things hang or on which a direction changes. So I looked um, at several different translations. Some use the word however or but, but I think what it's saying here is regardless or in spite of what's gone before, yet, yet what? The Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted, or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be united and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land 
for great will be the day. And again, we see that word Jezreel. So this is looking to a future time, to a better time, to when God will put things uh, right. I believe it speaks of the coming Messiah. It speaks of the Lord Jesus. It speaks of the church. Um, and uh, that's why we had our, our reading from, from one from one Peter, because Peter, uh, through the Holy Spirit, recalls this. And in verse 10, we read, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, this is... There's this lovely uh, picture, isn't there? Not so lovely as we read it of the um, Hosea's family who themselves are a picture of Israel, as it were. It's all really pretty awful, isn't it? You can see this, uh, these two people drifting apart, the wife going uh, with other Men, these children being born in what we would describe today as a dysfunctional family. And it all is set for disaster. And God says, yet. However, in despite, I'm going to do something wonderful. In a coming day, I'm going to, uh, the Israelites will still be like the sand of the sea, which of course, uh, echoes the promise, doesn't it, to to Abraham? You will recall all that um, way in Genesis. And uh, these verses are linked then with a message of hope. And uh, in when we get to chapter two, verse one, we read, "Say of your brothers, my people, and of your sisters, my loved one." So these two children, thankfully, are renamed because uh, God is speaking through Hosea now of his promises of a, uh, of, a, of a future, of his grace, of his mercy that he's going to exercise um, and have a people for himself, a people whom he loves. And you and I are numbered amongst those people. That's the grace and mercy of God. So when we move on then to um, chapter 2, I gave this the heading, The Triumph of Love. I found this very daunting, chapter 2. There are a lot of verses, and um, we have this description still of Israel's unfaithfulness described graphically and God's response of judgment and ultimate grace and love. Can't go through these things verse by verse because the clock is ticking round. And I think it's probably beyond my competence. But I wanted just to look at what sort of jumps out from the page, if you like. Highlights, maybe, or maybe lowlights as we go through uh, some of this and uh, so we come to verse 2 and now Hosea is speaking prophetically writing prophetically he's not um, recording his, um, speaking it in the same way and uh, but we have this rebuke your mother rebuke her in other places it says plead with her and uh, and um, so on and um, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband so again we have God speaking as it were about Israel and uh, disowning them and uh, just a few verses ago we read my people say of your brothers my people and your sisters my loved one and now God saying She's not my wife and I'm not my husband. She has to change her ways. Unless she changes her ways, her sin will be exposed. She'll become a wasteland and her children disowned. 
What I should have said is that um, some of you might have a footnote in your Bible which suggests that chapter 2 should begin with verse 10. And one writer I read suggests that chapter 1, chapter 1 should end with verse 1 of chapter 2. So in other words, the chapter things are not in the right place, but um, really we can read the whole thing through, don't we? Where the translators have put the, those divisions um, doesn't really have any consequence. So here we are then, the consequence of Israel's unfaithfulness, the separation uh, from God. In verses 4 to 7, we see this unfaithfulness and um, the consequences of it. Um, the purpose, perhaps, of um, this uh, adultery was a, was a mercenary one. It was done for payment to obtain um, a food uh, and uh, so on. And so that's uh, in verses uh, 7, 4 to 7. We, we read that. In verse 5, their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me food and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Food and luxuries. That's uh, the suggestion, perhaps. Uh, that's what led uh, Goma to this uh, to this kind of life. Uh, but uh, it's not, it isn't going to work out, is, is it, really? And uh, so when we uh, get to verse 7, there seems to be uh, the disappointment of her sin. She would chase after her lovers but not catch them. She would look for them but not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband as at the first. For then I was better off than now. This is the sort of downward spiral, as it were. And uh, But again, we might question the motive of this. Is this just a pragmatic view? It's reminiscent, isn't it, of um, the parable that the Lord told in Luke 15 about the lost son. You remember, you remember that? Of course you remember that. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? When he, we're told there that when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now we all know that the father's response was beyond that. But the son knew, simply from a, uh, a point of view of sustaining his body, keeping himself together, keeping himself alive, all he needed to do was to be a servant of his father, uh, so that he would get his uh, daily food and wage and, and so on. But the father took it further than that. And uh, we know that, you know, he expressed his love to him by giving him uh, the ring and the robe and the, uh, and the fatted calf and so on. But here, as we see this then in verse 8, we can't see this, can we, as a true repentance. She hasn't acknowledged uh, her sin. And verse 8 tells us she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her her grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Pharaoh. And this is really speaking of um, Israel at this time. The people were engaged in these uh, practices of um, sacrifices to Baal. Um, they, they turned from worshipping Jehovah God 
to the worship of idols, in particular Baal, which involved fertility rites, which involved sexual practices, and uh, even child sacrifice. And the idea was to secure from Baal a good harvest. He'd lost sight. of the giver of every good gift. So we see in Hosea and the other prophets, this described as an adultery or unfaithfulness, leaving the person you belong to, husband, in the eyes of God, and giving yourself to someone else. And we know in human terms how devastating this can be. Hosea knew from personal experience how much more for a holy and a righteous God to see the people that he had chosen. We reminded something of that yesterday too. If we, if we uh, you know, go uh, back to verses in Deuteronomy, God chose Israel. Out of all the nations, he chose Israel. And uh, he blessed them. And uh, But they've gone away from that. And... Uh, willfully turned away from him. Uh, they've been lured by these uh, idols and the sinful practices that went with it. And so we read in verses 19 to 13, uh, uh, 9 to 13, how that all that God had provided will be taken away, the ripe grain, the new wine, the clothing, and she will be exposed. That is, Israel, as well as um, Hosea's wife, defeated, falling to the surrounding nations. All these uh, sinful practices, all the fun, if you like, will stop. I like the way the Living Bible puts this. Uh, verses 11 and 12 puts it like this. I will put an end to all her joys, her parties, Holidays and feasts. I will destroy her vineyards and her orchards. Gifts she claims her lover gave her, and let them grow into a jungle. Wild animals will eat their fruit. This is God's judgment and punishment for Israel, punishment for her adultery, because she forgot the Lord. I will punish her for the day she burned incense to Baal. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, declares the Lord. That's really, we know what it's like to be forgotten, don't we? All of us in our lives have been forgotten sometimes. Uh, but God who chose these people particularly, who's lavished everything upon them, and they've turned from him, they have forgotten him. And if the chapter ended there, we wouldn't be surprised, would, would we? A prophecy, really, of the, the, the downfall of Israel. And a man called Derek Kidner, in a little book on Hosea, which he calls Love to the Loveless, introduces these verses like this. But the Lord keeps the initiative, not only in judgment, but in grace. Suddenly the whole scene lights up. Israel forgot the Lord, but he doesn't forget her. So we come to verse 14. We meant about the roller coaster. You see, now we're going up again now. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. I will give her back her vineyards and so on. Um, I was very really struck by that word allure, and it's not a word we use today, is it? The dictionary talks about attraction, enticing, even tempting. I think here it's the idea of courtship, isn't it? That God's going to go after Israel and draw her back to him. Mind you, courtship's another old-fashioned word, isn't it? But uh, some of us, we know what, know what we mean. And... Uh, so her vineyards are restored. Here's a contrast. These verses 
uh, the contrast, aren't they? Uh, to verses 12, where it says, I will ruin the vines and the fig trees. And uh, it speaks of this door of hope. To uh, the valley of Acre. That means the valley of trouble. Do you remember the story of Joshua? And uh, when they uh, crossed the Jordan and uh, Jericho collapsed, defeated, and the next place was a little place called Ai. And they, well, you know, it's much smaller than Jericho, not as well defended. But they failed. And they discovered the failure was because of the sin of one man who kept back silver and gold and clothing for himself, a man called Achan. And in the valley of Achor was where Achan and his family were stoned to death for taking those spoils from Jericho, contrary to God's command. But now this place, a place of trouble, becomes a door of Hope. Um, and uh, Isaiah, a contemporary of Hosea, says that has something to say about this in Isaiah 65, verse 10. Sharon will become a pasture for flocks and the valley of Acre, a resting place for herds, for my people who seek me. So now, out of um, seemingly uh, despair, as it were, then is hope. Parks back to the Exodus when the uh, Israelites were led out of Egypt, which itself was a new chapter in the history of Israel. And Jeremiah speaks about that, speaking, uh, echoing these words here about, the, about youth. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not so. He too was prophesying about unfaithful Israel and looks back to better time. So the Lord's going to restore a people for himself. The marriage relationship restored, verse 16. He's called husband rather than master. I understand the master was, uh, uh, could have been a reference to Baal again, where the people looked on him rather than as a loving father, but rather than a master. To be, um, to be appeased, to have these sacrifices made to. Now there is fidelity in the act and the absence of Baal worship. Verse 18 to 20 points us to a future day of the Lord. Some of these phrases are familiar from other prophecies, aren't they? Nature at peace with man, weapons discarded, God's people at one with him, betrothed to him forever. We know that in uh, the customs of Israel, betrothal is more than engagement, as we think, you know, as, as would be in our culture. This meant that the, the betrothed became in every sense bride and bridegroom. These were binding contracts or covenants. And that reminds me that we, the church, are the bride of Christ waiting for his return. We're his betrothed in righteousness, in justice, in love and compassion, in faithfulness. In verses, uh, we're moving on here, 21 to 22, God becomes the provider of rain so that the land produces oil and wine. You understand that Jezreel, previously spoken of as a scene of terrible bloodshed, means God will sow. So again, there's another reversal, another description of restoration culminating in the restoration of Israel's relationship with God. Verse 23, well, I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I called, not my loved one. I will say to those called, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. This echoes uh, the end of chapter one, of course. And we can appropriate it for ourselves. Let me remind you of our studies in Romans 9, 23 to 26. 
What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us whom he called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, as he says in Hosea, I will call on my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. We reminded yesterday that at the heart of everything is God's love, is God's mercy, is God's grace. And we too only deserve God's wrath. Yet as believers, we are the children of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are, that's uh, one John. And so we have this sort of roller coaster, despair and hope. But the end of it is that God has a plan and a purpose to have a people for himself whom he loves and whom he has reached out in grace and mercy. And we count ourselves amongst those people. And uh, chapter 3, we return to Hosea's story. He's telling the story now. And the first thing at the beginning of chapter 1, God said, go and marry a woman. A not very nice woman, as it turned out to be. So now he says, go back to that woman. Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. So you see, Hosea's love is to mirror God's love. God's love for Israel, despite her unfaithfulness. So Hosea obeys this, finds his wife and buys her back from the slavery into which she had fallen. Could she have sunk any lower? One writer suggests that she was valued at less than a slave, for the slave's price was 30 shekels. But uh, Hosea got a sort of discount. Now, he only paid 15 shekels, half the price, and um, uh, grain and stuff, which, which was a slave's daily ration. So I see two things here, and I, I have seen the clock. Firstly, we must remember that love is an action word. He said to Hosea, go and love your wife. We saw that again yesterday, didn't we? It's an action word. What was John write? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This was a demonstration of love. And secondly, it reminds us that there was a price to pay. For this speaks of redemption. Again, back to Romans 5 eight. God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We see God's love and its cost. I mean, this is often used, isn't it? Um, this little um, verse speaking of Hosea and paying for his wife to speak of redemption because that's what it does speak of, doesn't it? And we remind ourselves that there was a price to pay. Christ died for us. And so we see God's love and its cost. That cost was the death of Jesus. And we were reminded yesterday of, of that transac transaction that took place on the cross. And so Gomer is released from slavery and her lifestyle changes. There's this period of abstinence, which points to a future time. A better time. I've got to stop now. Uh, um, and, uh, well, almost stop. I mean, with a quote. So, um, I found in the um, uh, church where the bookshop is, in the library there, a little book written by Campbell Morgan. I like him. And uh, it helped me quite a lot with this, as the Mr. Kidman. But as I was turning through the pages, came to a page and somebody had highlighted something in the page. And I thought, 
must be significant. I would just say this a bit because that language is, is quite archaic. Um, but this is what he highlighted. Four things about God revealed in this prophecy. First, I find that God suffers when his people are unfaithful. Secondly, God cannot tolerate or condone sin. Thirdly, though that be so, God still loves the sinner in spite of the sinner's sin. And fourthly, that being so, God seeks the sinner in order to restore him. That's really good. And obviously, whoever had read the book, who knows how many years ago, had also been struck by that thought. Maybe they also quoted it in a sermon. Notes. Uh, but I hope that's helpful. I'm de just reminded of what we've been speaking of this evening, what we see in this uh, prophecy, although it's quite tortuous, is much of what we've speak, been speaking of all weekend, of God's love and grace, that he's reached out to us. We're just like the children of Israel. We're lost, we're wandering, we're prone to sin. In origin, we are sinners, but God has chosen us. He's lavished his grace upon us. And uh, I think that's the wonderful message that comes through from this, uh, what appears to be quite a difficult prophecy. I think we've got a song to sing. After which I'll just.